there's a new programming language on the horizon and it's called practical we've got shahar shimesh who will introduce this language to us uh, and explain the drivers behind its development um, so the title of his talk is the practical programming language or why c++ integers are fundamentally broken so let's give him an ear thank you um, so yeah the title of the um, uh, of the talk is designed to uh, lure you in into learning new stuff, not only about the new language, but also about why I wrote it. But I'm actually going to try and live up to this promise. So essentially, I'm starting by talking about two languages that I'm hoping you've heard of that are called the C programming language and C++. And um, I'll actually start by trying to ask you a question, which is doesn't work as well over this uh, um, over this medium, but uh, we'll, we'll do what we can. And uh, the question is this. Um, if we look at this uh, program, which I'm really, really quickly typing out, um, which is we accept uh, two uh, byte uh, arguments, and we'll call them A and B. And we return the following very, very complicated uh, calculation on them, which is essentially the average of the two. And the question is, if I do um, average of two, and four, what will the program do? What will it print? And I think most of you will be able to figure out that it will print the average, which, which is three. So let's just make sure that I haven't uh, screwed it up somehow. Um, hey, so far I'm, I'm doing great. Now, here's the interesting question. Instead of two and four, what if I ask for the average in 254 and 252? And I'll give you a few seconds to answer that on IRC. Um, people are complaining that you can't see it. Uh, I'll try to increase the font size and better. Ah, okay. Um, so, if I ask um, people are still complaining that they can't see does anyone get the video um, Without video, that won't work. Okay, I'm, I'm going to paste the program to the IRC channel. Oh, I can do that. Um, Do you have video now? Ah.
Okay, can you hear now? Okay, so this is the program and the question is, um, what does it do? And people are already pointing out that it overflows. And yes, uh, it overflows of, over an unsigned integer and therefore it is not undefined behavior. So um, the obvious answer would be 253, but um, one, still no audio. Okay, I'm not my or not on my end this time. So uh, the obvious answer should be 253 because that's the average of 252 and 254. But um, due to unsigned, we expect to get 250 divided by two, so 175. And let's see what happens when we actually run the program. So for some reason, um, we're actually getting 253. And that some reason is actually the topic of my, my talk today. So, you all figured out that um, a single byte overflows if I add 254 to 252, and we would expect it to return 125, but we don't. We get 253, and the reason for that has to do with the C's origin. Now, if you'll recall, um, or if you knew, um, when C originally uh, came out, the syntax looked something like this. <clears throat> so, and no, it doesn't uh, depend on the compiler. That's actually the way C is defined. The, there is no uh, implementation defined behavior in the program I wrote. It is fully defined by the spec. When C originally came out, um, the syntax looked like this. So what we see here is a function definition the arguments have no type, the type is defined later. So the, argu uh, the arguments type isn't part of the de function's declaration. And the function has no return value. And if I try to compile this, it compiles fine, but it does give a warning, which is very revealing. It says return type defaults to int. And the reason I point this out is because not only return types, K in RC, the original C, whenever it had any chance to figure out something or to guess something, the default go-to type for it was int. And that behavior, even though K in RC is now a uh, long uh, stain on our history, that behavior actually carries out not only to more than C, but also to modern C++. So what happened with our previous program was that A is a uint8 and B is a uint8, but the moment I did any operation on them, the compiler promotes them to integer, promotes them to integer. And then after it divides by two, it gets an integer, which means that what we need to do next, what the compiler needs to do next, is to cast implicitly from an integer, a 32 byte signed integer, to an eight byte, to a 32 bit, to eight bit unsigned, and it does so silently. And the silently is the part I'm actually uh, want to talk about. So, we actually can, can write a, a, a program that shows that in a very um, intense way, because um, if we do std int, a program that is very uh, in your face, 
and we get a, a 16 bit integer and we just return it as, as an 8 bit integer. And now if we try to compile this, it compiles without a warning. Even if we ask for extra warnings, it compiles without a warning. Even if we say fine, C is a bit of a, uh, uh, C is a bit uh, lenient in that front. Let's compile it as a C++ program. It compiles without warning. Even, and it's that, not, that's not a GCC thing. Um, uh, yeah, try, 19 isn't, uh, isn't out yet. So this program, not only is it a perfectly legal C and C++ program, it actually is warning free, despite the fact that it does something that we really would like to get a warning about. And the reason that's the case is because due to the fact that the C semantics uh, promotes everything to int, um, this means that uh, the, the compiler has no choice but to truncate integers to uh, smaller sizes without a warning. And that last part isn't 100% uh, accurate. First of all, some compilers in some circumstances do issue warning. But uh, I think the more interesting part is that uh, other languages tried uh, using a different model of operation, so they try to uh, to see whether there's a way to to solve this this uh, um, uh, plug this hole, so that um, um, we don't have implicit we don't have implicit truncation. And the reason this is important is because of the definition of the integer types in C. C defines um, basically it says this. It says um, uh, char is 8-bit, short is greater or the same as char, int is the greater of the same as short, and long is greater than the same as int. And or with the original days of 16-bit, uh, of, uh, um, that that meant just that, but today with 64-bit, we pretty much say that short is a 16 and int is 32 and long is 64. And, and that part, last part is very important. It means that the type we see as the default integer type, the type we promote to, isn't the, sm the largest type of integer we normally work with. It isn't even the native type that um, the machine has. And therefore the truncation becomes a bit of a problem. And a language that tried to handle this was D. Ah, okay, sorry. Here we go. Um, the D language uh, tried to handle this. I'm trying to get rid of. By, um, but uh, the D language has, among other things, two, um, uh, two rules that it lives by. The first is no narrowing conversions. And the definition of a narrowing conversion in D is a conversion or implicit narrowing conversions is a conversion that uh, converts from a um, type with uh, a certain amount of bits to a type with less, with smaller amount of bits. And what that means is that, uh, for example, a conversion between a 16-bit unsigned integer and a 16-bit signed integer is not considered uh, narrowing conversion and can be done implicitly. But more importantly, uh, it has another law which says any expression that is both legal in C and compiles in D should have the same meaning as in C. 
Now, on its own, this sounds like a very good law because, I mean, it means that you can just copy paste code from C and if it compiles, it's supposed to work. But what this means is that D inherited the implicit promotion to int rule we just saw, and we just saw that people are not even aware it exists. But in conjunction with the first rule, what this means is that as you type your code, if you do any sort of integer manipulation, you keep getting um, no, no narrowing conversion errors. So you keep doing custs. And that's, at the very least, that's annoying. Um, OK, so what does D do about that? Well, not a lot, but it does have one sort of exit, which is this. Um, D keeps something called uh, value range propagation. So if we take, um, if we try to write the same program in D, it would look something like this. Um, and we're doing return a plus b divided by 2. And that program actually compiles. And the reason it compiles is because The reason it compiles is because the compiler says, OK, A is now some value between 0 and 255, and B is some value between 0 and 255. So A plus B is some value between 0 and uh, 510. Uh, and now when divided by 2, the value has to be between 0 and 254. And that fits within a byte. So the language lets it through without an error. Um, so wh what we have here is that the uh, language keeps track of the uh, value range of the expression. And it, in some cases, it will allow it through. But it won't in, if I do, for example, a program called um, That will not compile. I can actually show it to you. So it complains about line eight, but it did not complain about line four. So, okay. Um, I think no talk about new programming language can ignore the uh, cool new kids on the block. So what does Rust do? Well, the answer is Rust. Um, I, I hope there are no uh, uh, too huge Rust uh, uh, enthusiasts in the crowd because um, I think that pretty typically Rust, what it does here is completely solve the problem while completely ignoring it. What Rust does is it says no implicit casts of any type between integer types, even if it's obviously clear that the, uh, the cast would be safe. So if we're trying to write the same program in Rust, what would we have is something like this. So A is uh, unsigned U 8-bit integer, and B is an unsigned 8-bit integer, and we're returning an unsigned 8-bit integer. And what we would do is something like this. And on its own, what this would return is
a runtime error. Because we do add with overflow. So the addition of 254 and 252 overflows, which is, you know, it's not a bad thing, but um, if you want to fix this, then things get a little um, verbose because what you have to do is you have to cast a to a 16 bit integer, but then you have to cast B into a 16-bit integer as well because there is no implicit promotion. And then you have to cast the result back to 8-bit. And that works. But doing three casts uh, in a row just to get the answer is a little too much for my tastes. And what's more important than that is that there are, these are a lot of explicit casts. And I hate explicit casts, and I'll try to explain why. Um, this is the way you cast, you do an explicit cast in C. You uh, do uh, the type in brackets followed by the value. This is how you do the same cast in C++ and in D and in Rust. Can anyone tell me what all of those have in common? I'll count down to 10 seconds to let you, the, the leg. Uh... What all of those have in common is that they only specify the destination type. So you're saying what you're casting to, but you're not saying what you're casting from. And coupled with the fact that a cast is a very destructive operation, it, it, uh, it chops off bits, it, it does whatever it can in order to turn the input value type into the output value type, this means that too many casts are not a good thing. And the fact that Rust makes you cast every time you do anything um, is, uh, it means that you, you sort of get used to casting all the time. And that I think is bad. Which brings me to, you know, this, I, I've been talking for 20 minutes now and I'm talking about practical. So, okay. Obvious next question is, what's your solution? And the practical solution is um, sort of rethinking of the entire problem and, um, and basically uh, what, I'm come, what I've come up with is a solution that I'm very happy with. Uh, I think it works great but it's not simple as in to, to lay out. So the simple answer is this. You write the code, if it compiles, you're fine. Not a problem. If there's a problem, it won't compile. Breaking this down, um, this comes down to four basic rules, which is this. First of all, no implicit narrowing, but mind you, I'm not talking about implicit type narrowing or bit narrowing. So I'm not asking whether I'm chopping off bits from the value. I'm talking about value narrowing. I'm asking whether the new type I'm casting to, I'm implicitly casting to, has less, can hold all of the values that the source type can hold. Now, um, to make things clearer, I'm talking about the actual expression. So I am using VRP. So I, I won't be uh, casting a signed 8-bit value to an unsigned value uh, instant type of any va on any size. It doesn't matter how big it is because it won't have place for the, uh, in for the negative values. But if the VRP tells me that this, val this expression will not be negative, then it's okay to cast it. 
The second is I'm not promoting. So if, if I'm adding two 8-bit uh, integers, I'm doing it as an 8-bit arithmetic. And if it overflows, it overflows. In practical, like in C++ and C, uh, signed overflow is undefined behavior, but unsigned overflow is fine. And, and that's where things begin to become interesting. If the operation, if the binary operation is between two types, two different types, the compiler will try to find a common type that will accommodate both. Uh, it says here minimal, that's not set in stone at this point in the language development. Uh, VRP, value range propagation. Uh, it means that the compiler tries to keep track of uh, what, 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 the, what the possible values at runtime might be there. So um, I'm trying to find two types that will hold the, uh, the, the values of both arguments and find a common ground, which means that I just got rid of the uh, dreaded sign-unsigned comparison error because the compiler will promote, if you, you try to compare an unsigned 8-bit value to a signed 8-bit value, the compiler will promote both to signed 16-bit value and compare them as such. So there's no truncating on the, of the ranges and no, uh, uh, no case where uh, the, 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 the result of the comparison can uh, erroneously be determined at, at compile time. And the last, uh, uh, the last is I'm using expected result type, and, and I want to explain what that is. When, uh, when I'm not automatically promoting, um, I might be, find myself at a problem if, for example, um, I have a function Let's let's look at the same one. So uh, I get A, which is 8-bit, and B, which is 8-bit, uh, and I'm returning a 16-bit integer. Now, if I just do this, then all of the languages you've seen so far, what they would do is the, assuming no promotion, is they will add the two as 8-bits, there will be truncation, there will be uh, overflow. And then after the addition, they will promote the result to 16 bit and you will get the wrong answer. So for all of the languages you've seen so far, to, in order for this to work properly, let's say it's not eight bit, but uh, uh, um, 32 bit, so that the, the automatic promotion doesn't save us. And this is 64 bit. Um, you'd need to cast A or B, or in the case of Rust, both to 64-bit in order for this to work properly. Not in practical. In practical, it starts, sort of propagates from the end result. The compiler says, this, at the end of the day, this needs to be a signed, an unsigned 64-bit value. And it propagates this down, and then because of the propagation, it it converts A and B at the origin to 64-bit value, and only then uh, does the addition. Uh, um, if we look at the, sorry. <coughs> um, if the, we look at how that looks, What we see is that um, this is the function uh, after name mangling. And what we see is that the first argument is called uh, zero and the second argument is called one. And then we load them and we zoo zero extend to both arguments and only then add them together. So with the... Uh, um, So with no uh, um, uh, casts at all, this does the right thing. 
So, where this where does this not work? This doesn't work at exactly the the example we started out with. Since our return type here is an 8-bit integer, if we now do a plus b divided by 2, for 252 and 254, this will bring the wrong result. In order to um, accommodate that, uh, Practical introduces a new type of cast, which uh, I name um, I name the safe cast. Which uh, looks like this. It says expect type. And the beauty of this cast, first of all, let, let's see how this looks. What you do is uh, uh, expect u16 encompassing the entire expression. And what this does is this uses only implicit casts and therefore it, it, it does not suffer from the same problems that all casts uh, suffer from because it doesn't do unsafe conversions. It will not narrow unless the compiler can convince itself that narrowing is safe. And it will perform the entire calculation at 16 bit. And then once it's done, the entire expression, including the expect, needs to be downcasted to 8-bit. But because of value range propagation, it knows that the value fits, and therefore I don't need a special cast here. So depending on how you want to count this, this is either counts as one cast or zero casts. So that's the basically the, the topic. I, wanna, um, I wanted to uh, leave some space for uh, questions. I will mention that once I found, I figured out the uh, expected result trick, this opened the, the path to, um, to something that I did not uh, expect when I started out, which is um, return type overloading. So I can, in practical, I can take two functions. So, um, Um, which in this case accept no arguments at all. And one returns an 8-bit integer and say it returns 17, and another returns a 16-bit integer and say it returns 42. And the compiler can tell them apart based on their return address, return type, because the expected type propagates. And if there's a context, for example, if you just do and you, you just call fun. So obviously that's uh, ambiguous. You can unambiguate it by using the same expect cast from before to choose the overload you're interested in. So that was one uh, interesting side effect of, um, of allowing of propagating the expected return type. Okay, uh, time for questions. Uh, thank you very much for the talk. So we are we have a chance now for questions as indicated. Anyone? Okay. Guess not. Okay. Or maybe people are still quickly yeah, typing actually, or something. Yes, someone yeah, is I, typing. We, we have to wait a minute for, for people to catch up.
Okay, so uh, we have one question. Why we don't don't I su suggest this feature for the next C plus um, plus? I actually tried to to suggest something. Uh, I I came from work. I worked for four years. I programmed in D in, uh, um, as a, as my uh, my main uh, day job. And um, I, the the problem with integers was was really really uh, big for me. And I tried working at D, which is a younger language than C++ and presumably more, uh, more um, flexible. And uh, I couldn't get it in. And once I, I started my own programming language and tried to figure out the rules for what has to do, it's pretty clear that these rules cannot be retrofitted into a language. Uh, it, it changes too much. Uh, it's something that you, you, you can do with when you start over from scratch, but not when you're you have a legacy code you have to support. Okay, thank you very much for that answer. Um, okay, so there's a couple of questions also on the pad. Let's see. Maybe let's start with just one more on IRC. Does practical have macros like Rust? Um, um, unlike uh, the rest of the languages, my uh, knowledge of Rust is more superficial. Um, if I understand macros correctly, they're... Um, uh, an extension of compile time modification of the of the functions, uh, and uh, if that's the case, then not only right now practical doesn't have it; it's a very young language. But not only is that in the road plan. In fact, um, the idea was to take uh, uh, these compile time execution and to compile time manipulation of uh, code and um, carry it over to to where I think it should be. I think that we can actually do better than D. So uh, I'm not sure it answers the question because I don't know Rust well enough, but uh, I hope it does. Okay, thank you. Um, another question is, uh, Ada has some similar type convention restrictions. Do you know about them? Um, no, I'm not familiar with Ada, but I think the conversion restrictions are not the issue here because we saw that Rust solved the conversion restrictions completely. It has no, no, no uh, unintended uh, operation, but it just solved it in a way that creates other set of problems. I think the question is not just the conversion restrictions, but uh, generally how you solve them and how you make the programming work. Okay, thanks. The next question is, is practical available as a language specification or even a compiler anyway? Or it's a theoretical academic exercise? No, no, no. You, you just saw it being compiled. Uh, it, it, there's a Salesforce project at github.com slash practical. Um, it's a work in progress. It's not yet ready for um, general purpose programming. In fact, I do, still don't have uh, 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 printing capabilities, but I'm working on it because I've, I've had to reinvent things that are fairly basic. It's a bit slow going, but uh, it, it's actually shaping out. It, it's already at the point where uh, um, it's mature enough to have its own syntax file in Veeam if you download the, the project, which is you know everything we need. We don't need anything else. But seriously, um, it, it's, it's getting to the point where you can actually write programs in it. And uh, it's open source. You're free to use it. The specs are... Uh, at uh, specs.practicalpl.org, um, I've got the um, I've got the URL for the language right here, so you can start here if you want to get it. And obviously, it's open source. All right, thank you. We've also got another question. While casting is indeed annoying in C, I found that the biggest issue is probably comparing signed with unsigned. Um, we, there are even some CVEs issued because of that. There's no such problem when doing assembly the correct way, but C++ hides the C and C++ hides this problem. Do you have any thoughts on that? Well, uh, it's it's not an accurate description. The problem with signed unsigned the comparison in C and C++ and D D is pretty horrible in that front because it doesn't even warn. Is that um, you get a, a type that is essentially, uh, it now has a negative value, but uh, because of the type promotion C does, it turns into an unsigned type, so it now turns into a very big value. And then you do something like compare it to zero, 
and the compiler at compile time, it, it doesn't get to the assembly level, says, well, it's a, an unsigned value uh, and you're comparing it to zero. So it's always true. And, and it, 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 in fact, it, it uh, compiles away the condition. So the problem with sign unsigned comparison is a real serious one that people sometimes underestimate and it has nothing to do with assembler. And like I said, practical doesn't suffer this problem because it will promote to a, a communal type that can actually hold all the values. So it will not have a problem with signed and unsigned comparison. It will either compile and do the right thing or not compile and tell you it can't promote. Okay, thanks. Our next question um, is, my understanding of the rule system is that one, there are no narrowing casts. We determine widening casts from explicit result types and permit intermediate widening using expect annotations with support for VRP. Um, is this description well, correct? Well, um, it, it's a bit simplified. First of all, um, the, the um, finding a communal uh, the part about finding communal uh, types is actually a simplification. What happens is that the internal uh, implementation of, uh, of the binary operators is exactly identical to the way overloading works. So um, the power I have when I write the compiler is the, the same power you, will ha you have when you write functions to, for overloading. And uh, essentially what happens is that um, there are uh, implicit casts defined later down the road you'll be able to define your own and each of those have a weight associated with it so um, the compiler seeks for a, um, a cast chain that allows it to fit all of the arguments into the function arg parameters and that requires that if you, if you define the overloads correctly that requires that they match that they use um, compatible types and uh, the expected type propagation basically works by the compiler preferring overload resolution. When doing overload resolution, it prefers to match the return type over matching the argument types. So it first matches the, the precisely the, the return type, and it only goes on to, what, to, to see which, which arguments match best if there is more than one match of the return type. So it's a bit more complicated than that. But like I said, the, the bottom line is it either compiles and works or uh, it, um, it, it gives a compilation error. All right, thank you. So we are almost out of time. Perhaps we'll just give uh, one last question. So do you have any comments on the rest of the language? For example, the interoperability of practical with the rest of the ecosystem? So um, I'm a bit too early at this point to, to have any concrete something to, to demonstrate, but obviously uh, at the very least, no modern language can live without being, being interoperable with the C. And um, down the road, I would like to have intero interoperability with the C++ as well. And with the compile time execution, I'm hoping that we'll be able to do without offline conversion. So. The, the dream is to be able to, to, put, to take a C include file and just sort of include it in practical and have compile time execution that converts it from a C include to practical include uh, and use it natively. All right, thank you so, thank you so much for the insightful talk. Um, even as you can see from RC, there's a lot of interest that has been generated. So I, I there's will, still some questions. I will hang about RSC now and answer questions there. Perfect. Thanks very much. Uh, there are a couple of questions also remaining on the pad. Maybe I, I will try to address them if that. people join the RSC and I will try to address them or, or oh. I'll try to, to answer them on the pad. Thank you very much. Shaka. Thank you very much.